Oystermouth Castle was once described as a fine manor in Oystermouth and the castle has a very rich and chequered history um, with many stories locked within its walls. In 1927, um, the city and county of Swansea bought the castle from the Duke of Beaufort, um, but gently over the years, the castle sort of blended into the landscape and got overgrown by the trees and woodland and landscape, and it sort of disappeared under this cloth of gentle greenery. Um, by 1989, Friends of Oystermouth Castle um, opened the castle to the public because they were very concerned about the castle being disrupted. Um, and over the years, the, the fabric of the castle crumbled and the masonry fell and more and more of the castle had to be closed. Caddy, we, we really started to encourage Swansea City Council to take this castle seriously. It's a very beautiful castle in a very beautiful setting and it, it was beginning to lose its integrity and, and lose its function. So we were very keen to encourage them to think of a comprehensive scheme to repair and, and make, the castle, make the castle more accessible. In 2002 it was identified that the castle was in serious need of some repair and at that stage the decision had to be taken, did we uh, apply for funding to try and get it conserved or do we simply close it and, and bear the cost of, of keeping it closed. Um, so we talked to Heritage Lottery Fund, we talked to CADU and most importantly we talked to councillors in Sydney County of Swansea to determine the most appropriate way forward and it was identified at that stage that there, there needed to be some sort of conservation plan for the castle. Uh, we were appointed in early 2009 by the local authority um, to advise them on how to repair the monument and to improve access for visitors to all the various uh, walkways etc. We've looked at what the, high, the most precious part of the building is and taken that and decided that's where the, uh, the, the new business facility should go to, to improve access in, to various parts of the building. The works began in September 2010 and when the guys there were starting work it became very apparent at just how vulnerable the castle structure was. You could literally sort of put your hand on a, a stone, pull one out and you'd have ended up with a pile of rubble. Um, so that was the key aim of, of the project but also we wanted to improve access to the castle. Bear in mind that the, the structure was built to keep people out. Um, so our main aim is to, to change the surrounding parkland to try and encourage people to get into the, the castle. We've had two, £2,300,000 towards this project, but it's, that's enough to conserve the castle, um, to restore the castle. We're talking many millions more. It's obviously it's, it's a, it's a bottomless pit in terms of an ancient monument. It's been there for hundreds of years. It needs a lot of tender loving care to bring it back up to, uh, to modern standards in certain areas. Um, but we have enough money to make, a, make it a, a, a suitable project. What we've done is primarily stabilisation of the building, which involves the removal of the vegetation and the likes. Um, we've then subsequently chased out all the existing mortar that's on the building. That's been repointed and any loose stonework has been uh, stabilised to prevent danger of stones falling off the building. In addition to that, we've also constructed a new visitor centre within the, the old chapel or the existing chapel as it's known as. Um, that has been quite a challenge in itself in as much as access is very limited. What we've had to do is fabricate the visitor centre off-site remotely. It's subsequently been dismantled, flat-backed um, in effect brought back to site and then reassembled through the narrow doorways and in position. Um, in addition to that, we've also created new disabled access. We've also incorporated a disabled lift within the castle itself to access further areas than what they could previously. What we've also been allowed to do here, in conjunction with the local authority and um, local employment scheme known as Beyond Bricks and Mortar, um, it's allowed us to engage local labour who are actively seeking work. It's meant that I can provide security for my family. Um, so thanks to Swansea City Council and Bricks and Mortar and WRW, it's given me the opportunity to prove that I can and want to work. We've put in a much more gentle gradient um, to, to the castle now and some much needed resting points on the way, which gives you the opportunity to sort of drink in the magnificence of the structure that's been unveiled from its greenery. And I think the visitor facilities that have been put in now are very fitting for the magnificence of um, that structure of when it was built. Alina's Chapel has been closed for hundreds and hundreds of years and very few people actually have experienced 
the height of the chapel and what it was like to look out of the tracery window. While we were doing the works, we've made some really good um, and interesting discoveries. Um, the first one was uh, the discovery of some medieval paintings, which I've got to admit look like a bit of graffiti to me, but um, the, the real historians who were involved in this project um, were extremely excited um, about these little red marks that can be seen. And we've had those red marks interpreted and they are actually um, medieval nimmed angels. And there's very little plaster work left in the country um, which is original and, and has this sort of decoration on it. Um, so that was a really good part of the project. Um, probably the most exciting um, and rewarding part of the project is a very, very small part of the project for me, which was when the um, boarding was taken off the spiral staircase and it unveiled some 17th century graffiti. Um, there's graffiti there from the 17th, 18th century through the two world wars and to the 1970s. So what we did exactly is to decide to put two new um, pods, two new buildings, right inside the heart of the castle, one of which will be the new visitor's reception, and one will be a workshop where education, etc., can, can be taken out inside there. The Chancellor or Chapel would have been the, the, um, a private chapel for the Lord of the Manor, and um, it would have been the highest, the grandest architectural space within the building and that's what we've chosen to reinterpret with modern 21st century glass walkways to try and contrast with, with the history of the building itself. From 2010 to 2011, we're adding our own layer of history to all the multi-layers of history that have gone before here. People can have their own imaginative experience and discovery within the castle and we really didn't want to lose that going back in time and away from modern day within the area. So hopefully we've managed to retain that balance between informing people and keeping the sense of discovery. It's always been an iconic feature of, of Swansea and, and Mumbles and Oystermouth. Uh, but it was, it was looking sad, and that was commented on, that it was a, a, such a key feature. It was a shame that it looked in such a dilapidated state. So for the, for the local residents of, of Swansea and, and Mumbles in particular, it's going to be a, a massive feature, not just in terms of its architectural heritage, but in terms of its access. You know, we, we are uh, ensuring that there are, there are events programmes there, there are community programmes there, there, there's community archaeology, for example. So, so people see and feel ownership of the project. It's not just a, a standalone monument. Well, I'm sure it'll become one of the, the best-loved castles in Wales and hopefully one of the best visited. Uh, it's here in Gower, which already has a, a steady stream of people coming on their holidays, and it's in a beautiful location. To have been able to open up the castle to people and let them enjoy their local heritage and be part of their local heritage and um, to let their heritage mean something to them and give them a sense of pride in their locality um, and hopefully enjoy the events and activities and information they will find out at the castle um, is extremely gratifying I guess. I derive a huge personal sort of satisfaction and pleasure from seeing what is an iconic feature of Swansea you know, being preserved for future generations. Welcome to Oysmouth Castle. We are standing in front of the 13th century gateway. This is built of stone, limestone, which proliferates in the area. Above the arch of the gateway is a line of stones projecting out about 10 centimetres. And within that space, when the drawbridge is raised, the drawbridge would sit snugly. Above the drawbridge are two archways, and above that would have been a third archway. And if you follow the line of the stonework to the spring of stone, you can actually see where the arch would begin and end on the western side. So the two spring of stones are virtually missing. The archways would have supported a weight, a balcony, and within the balcony would be holes called machicolations. Uh, through the machicolations would be dropped stones, 
um, crossbow bolts, spears, and any kind of defensive missile. The balcony probably connected to the two missing drum towers, the one on the west and the one on the east. We don't really know, there's no proof that the towers were ever finished or even built, but they were certainly designed for because to the right, on the east and to the west, are open doorways. The defenders of the castle would come through these open doorways from the inner courtyard. At ground level, they would ascend a spiral staircase. And if you then look at the joist holes, you would see where the first floor would have been positioned. Assuming that enemy soldiers had breached the doorway, they would then enter this chamber and be halted by a portcullis, which would slide down from the room above, called the portcullis room. The invading soldiers would be halted just here, but immediately overhead is an amossoir, a murder hole, and through that murder hole would be dropped missiles. Not the boiling oil that one associates with castle defences, but on this occasion perhaps quicklime, quicklime in a powdered form which would enter the soldiers' eyes and blind them. Perhaps also they would have an iron cauldron over a fireplace. The cauldron would be filled with sand and raised to a red-hot temperature. That red-hot sand would be poured through the murder hole and then would cascade down on the soldiers, giving them severe burns. We're now standing inside the portcullis chamber. Immediately to my right, within the flooring, is the slot for the portcullis. This would be operated by a winch. And if enemy soldiers had breached the doorways, then the portcullis would be lowered by the winch. We are now standing in the inner courtyard of Oystermouth Castle. The very first building to be erected here is on my right. This is called the South Keep and was an original construction of William de Londres, who was granted the parish of Oystermouth by the Earl of Warwick in 1106. Some generations later, his successors, the de Brios family, built the chapel to my left. The chapel block is quite impressive, and if you compare the structure of the walling to the south keep, you can see that each of the, the uh, stonework levels have been coursed. We're now standing at ground floor level of the chapel block and immediately facing east is a narrow lancet window with stone bench seats on either side. Follow me up the spiral staircase, up onto the second floor, and into Alina's chapel. We are now in the private chapel of Alina de Brios, and today this is where the old meets the new. Above the high altar is a Gothic window dated to about 1327, probably installed by Alina de Brios on her return to her Lordship of Gower. In the southeast corner of the chapel is a carved stone piscina within which communion vessels would be washed. Within the south wall of the chapel is a very deep niche, which was probably the private pew of the de Brios family, and would have been highly decorated with frescoes of red, yellow, and black. In 1692, the antiquarian Isaac Hammond described Oystermouth Castle as having many walkways firm, 
many windows and archways with painted flowers and coats of arms. We're standing in the East Watchtower of Oysmouth Castle and looking directly east towards Swansea Bay. During the Middle Ages, of course, Swansea Bay did not exist because the high tide level of the sea would probably have been at about Mumbles Lighthouse. And what we see immediately behind me, the sweep of the bay, would have been wooded, probably silver birch. To the south we have All Saints Church and the church is remarkable for its Norman tower. This tower had been built for defensive purposes and if you look carefully at the top it is crenellated. In times of trouble when warring bands of Welsh warriors entered Gower the local population, mostly Saxon, Anglo-Normans, would retreat into the tower of All Saints Church. In the 18th century, small mosaic patterns were found in the graveyard of All Saints Church. And it appears that All Saints Church is erected upon a Roman mansio. This is a building which would have been a supply depot for the Roman fleet.